Hello and welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional and I hope you are too. Welcome back to Stardew Valley. Last time we had an incredibly successful season in spring, so let's see what summer has in store for us. There's plenty to talk about again, so let's jump right in. While I start off the chores and tend to the chickens, let's take a look at the screenshot of our farm. Whenever a season rolls over, there's gonna be a little bit of, we'll call it damage to the farm. There are a bunch of weeds and stones and little pieces of wood that will spawn on your farm between the seasons. Looking at the screenshot right now, we don't have to worry too much about that because this place is kind of a mess. You'll notice too that because our strawberries cannot survive in summer, they have died off, but the sprinkler did still water that spot. This is a very nice feature of multi-harvest crops when you're prepping for the next season. Speaking of, task number one is setting up this field. I head to Pierre's to buy seeds and our cash crop this season is gonna be blueberries. We have not talked much about the farming mechanics yet, but one thing that you can buy for your crops is fertilizer. Fertilizers have different effects on your crop, such as increasing the quality or decreasing the grow time. If you go to the Stardew Wiki, they have all of this information available, and if you look here, if we apply the base level of speed grow, we will actually get an additional blueberry harvest this season. Um, yes please. While in town, I make sure to pick up my axe, which has now been upgraded to steel. The steel upgrade allows us to chop more difficult pieces of lumber. There are giant logs on the map that we were not able to break before, including this one just on the west side of the forest. Breaking it with our steel axe opens up access to the secret woods. There are a couple of fun things in here, but I'm mostly here for the hardwood. Hardwood is kinda like wood, but harder if you know what I mean. It has some different properties and will unlock some new recipes for us. Chopping these big logs also gives a fair amount of foraging experience, so you can add this to the daily chores. For a little while, anyway. Aside from that, the only thing that was important today was making sure that our crops were plant and watered, so check marks all across the board, let's lock that one in. At the start of day two, just look at them. All of our crops are watered by sprinklers. It's a beautiful sight. I do my chores and then it's time to really start seeing what this farm has to offer. The Meadowlands is a new farm after all, so I don't know what it looks like underneath all of this stuff. Um, resources, yes, resources. While I clear all of this out, we can talk about the tools and their upgrades. We start off with the most basic suite of farming tools. The hoe, the watering can, the axe, the pickaxe, and the scythe. The scythe does get upgrades, but for now we're going to ignore it, only focusing on the tools that the blacksmith upgrades. Each of these tools, including the garbage can, is upgradable with materials from the mines. Smelting your ores into bars, you can then upgrade your tools, including a little bit of gold and two days of Clint's time. The tool Tools then become better or unlock abilities. For the hoe and watering can, as you upgrade them, if you press and hold the action button, the area that that action affects becomes bigger. Copper tools work in a three tile straight line, iron tools in a five tile straight line, with gold affecting an area of three by three and iridium affecting an area of six by three or 18 tiles per action. Also, I did misspeak during spring. Upgrading the watering can does increase its capacity as well. Upgrading the axe and pickaxe decrease the number of hits it takes for the tool to break items. It also allows you to break more difficult types of items, like I just mentioned with the axe now being able to break hardwood. The pickaxe, once upgraded to steel, can break the boulders on the farm, both of which we have and will lend to today's plan. If we didn't have those upgrades, we'd be leaving big stumps and boulders kind of scattered everywhere, and I would rather just clean the whole farm out at one go. Finally, upgrading the trash can simply gives you a little bit of money when you delete items. It makes triaging your inventory feel just that little bit better. The project of clearing out the farm extends into the following day, but this is what we're looking at now. I can actually see what we have to work with for farmland now, so I can start making a plan. That's it for days two and three of summer. All right, aside from the chickens, the farm's pretty much handling itself for a little while, so on the start of day four, I head to the community center to drop off a whole bunch of the items we've been collecting. This is mostly for inventory management, to be perfectly honest, but we do manage to complete one bundle. The summer forage bundle is gonna give us a reward of a few summer seeds. These are the forage-style seeds and do exist for every season. 
When planted on the farm, they act just like regular crops, except for they grow into forage. I feel that foraging is one of the more difficult skills to get experience for, so being able to grow some of these is really nice. That's gonna lend itself nicely to a goal that we have this season of filling out as much of that farmable space as we can. Now we can see the farm, let's use it. This is gonna require a lot more sprinklers, so we have some mining ahead of us. On the third day of summer, you'll get a message overnight that says that you heard an earthquake. What this indicates is that the train platform is now open. My last task of the day is heading up there to start clearing out some space. You are limited in where you can grow crops on the map, however you are not limited in where you can place other things or grow trees. This big open space looks perfect for a tree farm. On the morning of day five, something weird has happened. Our TV isn't working and when we walk outside, there's this eerie green fog over everything. This is a green rain event, another new addition to 1.6. It occurs once randomly every summer. The map is now absolutely filled with these weeds and these giant moss plants. The trees are covered in moss. Very cool. And since I'd never seen this mechanic before, I had no idea how valuable moss was. As such, instead of stopping and, you know, looking it up or something, I just spend the entirety of day five harvesting moss. A second reason that I chose to do this is that I do know how valuable fiber is gonna be in the future. Once we reach level seven foraging, it'll go a long way to helping out that tree farm. I'm talking, of course, about tree fertilizer. Tree fertilizer dramatically decreases the growth time of wild trees. Fertilized trees will also grow in winter, which is not normally the case. Ah, the rabbit holes. What defines a wild tree? Well, unsurprisingly, they're the trees found in the wild. The pine, the maple, the oak, and the mahogany. There are more wild tree variants, including mushroom, but really the biggest difference is that they do not bear fruit. Fruit-bearing trees and tea bushes are not affected by this fertilizer. The morning of day six is spent planting that tree farm and fertilizing the oak trees. I'm only interested in fertilizing the oak trees because I want to get some tappers on these immediately. Tappers on oak trees are going to give us oak resin, which we're going to need a lot of to build our keg empire. This is of course all to build our final egg empire. I spend the rest of the day mining when I get really tired and really beat up. Another thing unlocked in this train area is the spa. It's completely free of charge. Just walk your way into the waters and you will begin recovering energy and health. Uh, we might not be able to afford salads right now, but it's all about appreciating the little things. Now that I feel like we have a solid foothold in the summer season, it's time to settle in for a few days of mining. On day seven, I make it to floor 100 in the mines, rewarding us with a star drop. There are seven of these star drops locked behind various achievements throughout the game. We'll cover them as we grab them, but obviously one of those achievements is reaching level 100 in the mines. Eating a star drop increases your maximum energy by 34 points permanently. If you remember during the character creation, whatever you set your favorite thing to is what will display in this dialogue box. If I'd kept my favorite thing as redundancy, then this would have read, it reminds me of the taste of redundancy. I'm not 100% sure what that tastes like, but it does sound more bitter than the eggs that I prefer. My life then becomes chores and mining for the next several days. On the morning of day 11 in summer, we see that some of those summer seeds have fully grown. These seeds take seven days to grow and every time I harvest them, I can just recraft them into more seeds. This allows me a really cheap and easy way to continue expanding this field down here without having to invest a bunch of gold into seeds. Once we have enough money, I will be making sure to plant a bunch of melons down here and to make sure that I have everything that I need for the community center. Also on day 11 is the Luau. I haven't been and probably won't be focusing on social aspects for a little bit still, but this is a great event to gain some. You're able to add an ingredient to the potluck soup and based on what you add, it will have different effects. If you toss in something that the governor loves, you will gain friendship points with pretty much every villager. If you say throw in sap or something that doesn't taste very good, you will lose friendship. There's something special we can throw in, but I don't have enough friendship with Marnie to get it yet, so we'll revisit that in year two. 
Exciting news on the morning of day 12, our blueberries are ready for their first harvest. This will be our cash crop for the summer, so although I will be keeping a few blueberries, the majority of them will be going to the bin. Throughout my mining adventures, I am making sure to make periodic stops around the floor 40 to 60 range. I'm primarily targeting the dust sprites for coal, but this is serving a second purpose. There are monster hunting goals in the game that will again provide rewards as you complete them. Slaying 500 of these dust sprites is going to reward us with a ring that I really want. On day 12, I have enough kills, so I go visit the boys in the Adventurer's Guild. Here, you can buy and sell weapons, and after completing goals, you can talk to the man in the armchair. Gil then rewards us with the Burglar's Ring. While we're wearing it, monsters have a greater chance of dropping loot. This is really going to help us with our coal reserves, but it also serves another purpose. This is not the only mine in the game, and the Skull Cavern mines have some enemies with some pretty juicy loot tables. For now though, it's mine, 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 mine. Overnight, our blueberry shenanigans levels us up to eight in farming, unlocking those kegs I was talking about. We also reached level seven in combat, but now the money train is starting to flow. That's just shy of 35K in the bank, and we're gonna be getting this four more times this month, just from the blueberries. On the morning of day 13, it's raining, so I decided it's time to pivot away from the mines. After the chores, I run up to the tree farm and you can see how much of a difference tree fertilizer made. Which of these trees do you think was fertilized? I slap on as many tappers as I was able to craft and spend a little bit of time fishing the mountain lake waiting for Robin to open. Along with buying and selling basic resources like wood and stone, Robin also serves as the builder in the game. Now that I have a bit of cash to throw around, it's time to build a barn. I'm not going heavy on chicken coops quite yet. There are a couple goals I want to meet first. Then I scoot on down to Clint, turning in my pickaxe to upgrade it to gold. I didn't have the 10k to throw around before, but this is definitely going to make our mining adventures a lot quicker. The rest of the day I spend fishing on the pier at the ocean. I'm here collecting anything that I need for the community center, as well as pursuing our second legendary fish. The crimson fish is only available from this dock during the summer. Weather is irrelevant. Unlike the legend fish last season though, I cannot catch this guy again, so he's gonna be stuck into a box until I can afford a fancy fish tank for him. Then it's chores on chores, continuing my fishing adventure on the next day. I wasn't quite able to catch all of the fish that I needed for the community center because it was raining and I need a puffer fish. They're kind of a nasty catch, but once it's done, it's done. Then, while we're fishing for the community center, I might as well pop by the secret woods and fish that little lake it has. I catch the wood skip and then spend the rest of the day pretty much just doing chores, gathering resources, the usual. On day 15, I grab my fully upgraded pickaxe and then just continue expanding the field. Going for aesthetics in the first year is usually not something that I do. These farms grow very organically. Again, I'm spending most of year one pretty much just getting rich. On the morning of day 16, our second blueberry crop is ready. I'm not going to be sticking this one in the shipping bin, however. We're actually going to be heading to town and selling it directly to Pierre. The reason I want to do this is because I'm also bringing some stuff to the community center. I fill out a couple of blank spaces in the bundles, but the most exciting part is that after selling everything direct to Pierre, we're coming here with 52,000 gold. The vault rewards are entirely money-based in the community center, totaling a donation of 42,500 gold. I donate all of it, giving us some pretty nifty items, but also unlocking the bus. This will unlock overnight, giving us access to the desert. Similarly to the minecarts that we repaired last season, this repair happens overnight, so we can't quite get to the desert yet. Instead, I pop down to Clint's where I can finally discuss geodes and the museum. Throughout your adventures, you'll be finding ores, gems, minerals, and artifacts throughout the world. You'll also be finding a bunch of these geodes, which if you bring to Clint for processing, can be broken open to reveal just those. Or minerals, gems, you know. It takes a small fee to process, but generally will net you a profit. Before the profits though, if you roll over the item, anything that says Gunther can tell you more about this means that it can be donated to the museum. This is the first that I'm showing you my museum, and yeah, it's got some stuff filled out already. I just had no idea when to include this, there's so much to talk about. Through donating things to the museum, you can collect even more rewards, most of which are going to be aesthetic, so I'm just going to let Gunther hold on to them for now. Any minerals and gems that have already been donated and aren't useful for me in the future, I'm just selling immediately. At the end of our mining adventures on day 16, I have some bombs on me which I can use to clear out this little piece of rubble. 
This gives us access to the dwarf in the corner who has a pretty nifty shop for buying bombs and mining materials. On day 17, the goal is to head to Skull Cavern, but the bus is not available until 10 a.m. That would be because the town drunk, Pam, is in charge of driving it, and she's far too hungover to get up before 9. So I keep myself busy doing a few chores, but I also pop down to Marnie's ranch. Robin completed construction of our barn, and so now I'm able to buy a cow. Let's see, cow nicknames. Steak! I then do a little bit of organization around the farm because even though I'm not going super heavy for aesthetics right now, I do still enjoy having a couple of nice things around. After that, we're ready to head to the desert, so I talk to the little box, pay 500 gold, and off we go. Yes, coming out to the desert, at least for now, is going to cost us 500 gold every trip. I grab the forage around here, both for the community center and because the cactuses are fantastic energy. And then we can head into the Skull Cavern Mines. These mines are locked until you get the Skull Key from level 120 in the mines back in the valley. Which, by the way, is also the bottom of those mines. This mine is bottomless and there's no elevator this time. You start at floor one every time. The deeper you go in this mine, the higher the chance of iridium ore spawning. I actually get incredibly lucky on floor eight, finding a cluster of the iridium ore. Usually, you don't even see iridium ore until you're in the 30s. One thing that really helps you get lower faster are the holes in this mine. When a ladder appears to the next floor in Skull Cavern from Breaking Rocks, it has a 20% chance to appear as a shaft. This shaft can drop you anywhere between 3 and 15 levels deeper. A note though, if you fall 15 levels, be prepared to take some damage, because it will hurt you. The enemies in this mine are also significantly more challenging to defeat, but they do drop some pretty awesome stuff, very much helped by our burglar's ring. We'll be getting a bunch of resources from them, including great food and even full-on iridium bars. The drawback to the higher reward is the higher risk. I don't even make it by the first day in Skull Cavern without dying. When you die, you will likely wake up in the clinic with Harvey telling you that somebody found you unconscious. There are a couple different dialogues, but pretty much when you die, you come back with zero health, zero energy, and you've lost some items. In this case, all I lost was a solar essence and a ruby, so fine. It kind of sucks, but hey, that's the game. We're then free to carry on about the rest of our day, but we are very much hurting. This differs from the passing out mechanic that happens at 2 a.m. If you pass out from the time, the day is simply over, you lose up to 10% of your money, and carry an energy penalty the next day. Noted, dying bad. The goal for the rest of the month is pretty much to spend it in Skull Cavern, upgrading our capabilities on the farm. Our blueberries are going to continue making us money, while I focus on farming materials for the next tier of sprinkler. We've been using quality sprinklers, which water the eight crops around them. I'm gunning for iridium sprinklers, which water 24 tiles around them. Unfortunately, I die again on the next day, but this time it hurts a little bit more. I lose my red cabbage seeds, which I really want for the community center because they aren't available until year two, and I lose 39 iridium ore. Oh, that's painful. You are able to buy back one of these items from the Adventurer's Guild after dying, but it's a little pricey on the Iridium side. Unfortunately, this is a loss I'm just gonna have to accept. Good news though is that I found a Prismatic Shard yesterday, which we did not lose during the death. Prismatic Shards are incredibly rare and incredibly useful. I always take my first Prismatic Shard out to this little cluster of pylons in the desert. If you present your Prismatic Shard to the center of this little cluster, it will upgrade to the Galaxy Sword. This sword is far and above the Obsidian Edge that I've been using thus far. Remember though, you can play this game any way you see fit. My girlfriend, for whatever reason, always uses her first prismatic shards to make fancy clothing. I don't understand, but they make her happy, so right on. After a few more days of mining, it's time to do a little bit of chores on the morning of day 21. A neat little trick if you have tappers set up at the train station is to have another tapper on the oak tree just outside of the train station. You can visually verify whether your tappers are ready or not from pretty much across the map just by taking a few steps out of the mine entrance. I collect all of the oak resin because I want kegs. 
I then turn a few more things into the community center on my way to Clint to process more geodes. Day 21 is primarily about making sure that during my mining adventures, everything else is still running smoothly. I take a quick stop at the Adventurer's Guild just to check on those monster goals, and yeah, you can see that there's some work to do yet. We still haven't even uncovered all of the different enemy types. On the morning of day 22, I'm setting up a couple of those kegs that I've been talking about. All of the melons that we have growing at the base of the farm right now will be processed through these kegs. We'll also be using them to create our own coffee instead of constantly having to buy it. And they're going to be processing pumpkins for us next season. From there, we can really start ramping up a wine industry, but again, little steps. Our recent round of donations to the museum has also granted us the Rusty Key. This grants access to the sewer in town. There are a couple of interesting things down here, but right now all I'm focused on is talking with Krobus. Over time, we will be befriending the shadow person, but right now all I want is that star drop that he's offering. 20,000 gold for a star drop is a steal. Thank you, blueberry money. At the end of day 22, we trigger a cutscene, which again, I have not seen before. Looks like Mr. Key is doing a little bit of crop dusting with some mystery boxes. I don't know what these are yet, but now we can find mystery boxes around the world. I also level up to 10 in farming, granting us a perk choice. We can either have our crops grow 10% faster, or we can have our artisan goods worth 40% more. Artisan goods are generally goods that are processed through a machine, like our kegs. We also make a little bit of cash, but throughout this season I've been spending money as quickly as I've been able to make it. On the morning of day 24, we have another blueberry harvest ready. You can pretty much assume that all of the time that I'm cutting out is just me spending time in the mines. I will also mention that as we can afford it, I will continue to upgrade both our barn and our coop. There are three tiers of these buildings, the basic, the big, and the deluxe. Their footprint on the map does not increase, but their internal size does, as well as unlocking a couple of features. We'll come back to this more later, but right now, the biggest upgrade that I'm looking for is the diversity in our animals. With the big barn now upgraded, we can buy a goat to keep our cow company. The coop is next on the list to get some ducks rolling. I'm feeling pretty broke right now, so I spend the last part of day 24 doing a little bit of fishing. Honestly, I'm not convinced that this was the best use of my time because the amount of money that we're making from fishing has really fallen off. In the early game, making 4k off of a bit of fishing feels pretty good, but nowadays it's kinda lackluster feeling. Especially compared to the 40k that our blueberries just made us. As we progress through the last few days of summer, the plan is pretty much the same. Mine and harvest stuff when it's ready. At this stage in the season, replanting things is simply not worth it because they'll die before they can fully grow. You can see how much expansion I managed at the base of the farm here throughout the month, but honestly, most of this was done about halfway through. I haven't started introducing those iridium sprinklers yet, but don't worry, they're right around the corner. At the end of the day, after more mining, you can see that now that I've stopped crafting all of these forageables into more seeds, we're actually making pretty good money off of them. 10k for just a portion of that lower field? I'll take it. And to nobody's surprise, I pretty much spend the entirety of day 27 in the mines. And here we are on the final day of summer in year one. Thanks to the speed grow we applied, our blueberries have one final yield for us, as well as cleaning up anything that remains in that lower field. From there, pretty much the rest of day 28 is going to be spent setting up for fall one. It's time to clear out this last little bit of area on the left and start laying out those iridium sprinklers. I also reconfigure my kegs and get a little mini upper field ready as well. The animals for now have just been kind of shunned to their own island over there. Don't worry though, now that I can see the entire farm, I definitely have plans. Our tappers at the train station are once again ready so I can harvest those. And while I'm in the area, I donate a bunch more stuff to the community center. We're getting pretty darn close to finishing the pantry here. We just need a little bit more animal products and the fall crops to unlock the greenhouse. The greenhouse allows you to grow any crop at any time all year. Back in the old days, it was always a pretty hard push to get your greenhouse ready before winter, but uh, these days there's something different. We're gonna have to get back to that later though, let's check out what we accomplished during summer. Taking a look at the screenshots of the farm from day 1 to day 28, we accomplished a lot. We cleared all of the debris from the map, started expanding our crops into the lower section, and now... 
Now we're ready to go even bigger. Because it's a late night event and pretty beautiful, I'm gonna go to the Dance of the Moonlight Jellies. All the villagers are hanging out at the beach and once we talk to Lewis, we activate the cutscene. What a beautiful send off for summer. Taking a look at what we've accomplished, we've now earned over 360,000 gold, holding on to about 50k right now. For our skills, we're now maxed in farming, mining, and fishing, with foraging and combat not that far behind at level 9. Summer very much felt like a month where we made less progress, but very much set ourselves up for success in the future. So as we close our eyes and lay down for a hard-earned sleep after 28 days of summer, I'm reminded that we have like 37,000 gold of blueberries that just sold as well. Oh yeah, I'm feeling real good about fall. I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. Your support makes these videos possible so I can continue to put all of my effort into producing this content for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. Watching until the end of the video, your engagement and subscriptions all help my channel so much. If you feel like I've earned it, consider leaving a like and comment about summer, what you would have done differently, or just to say hi. Hey there! If you'd like to keep up with my future releases, be sure to subscribe and enable notifications to never miss a video. I'm feeling myself being lost further and further into the Stardew world, so for the coming weeks, I will likely only be releasing Stardew content. I apologize to my Poke fans, but I need this. Tune in next week to see what we get up to in fall. Until next time, take care everyone.